The other thing, which is interesting, and I'll call it to your attention, is remember John talked about moral values, and I deferred to the general idea among psychologists that moral values are fairly constant. But look what we actually find. If people experience the procedures of their organization as being fair, they're much more likely to say that the policies of the organization are consistent with their moral values. So in fact, if you use procedural justice, you get legitimacy and you get the morality effects that John was talking about. You get both of those things because people are interpreting the fairness of workplace procedures as linked up to the morality of their company, basically. So just a straight shot, does procedural justice lead to rule following behavior? Absolutely. What's the main factor that shapes whether employees are following the rules? Procedural justice in both of the studies, fair procedures, people follow the rules. I mentioned that this is self-reported behavior. Let me just show you, if we use the supervisor ratings of the employee's behavior, we still find that if the employees say they have supportive values, their supervisors say they follow the rules. If the employees say the procedures are fair, their supervisors say they follow the rules. So we try to check for self-report problems, still we find the same thing. Okay, so the first kind of organization that I think might be interesting to us now is a work organization, a for-profit organization, and I'm arguing that in a situation of that type, we see a way to motivate employee behavior, bring it into line with organizational rules based upon values. But I think there's a different kind of organization that has drawn great interest from us in the last couple of years, and that's, in this particular case, the Army, scandals in the Army. That's consistent with a long history of scandals with the police. It seems that there are constantly problems regulating the behavior of agents of social control, whether they're combat soldiers, police officers, federal agents. So can we use this approach with that group of people? I looked at three different groups of people, police, federal agents, and soldiers. Again, they complete questionnaires about their workplace, and we look at workplace behavior. The sample that's broad across law enforcement and the Army. You, this is not going to be surprising to you. We have the same concept of values and the same set of risks, and the same kinds of concerns in particular deference, but also compliance. So do values <coughs> behavior among agents of social control? The answer is absolutely yes, that both for compliance and deference, police officers, federal agents, soldiers are more likely to be complying with organizational rules and policies, primarily because they think that the rules are legitimate and consistent with their moral values, and to a much lesser degree because they fear being caught and punished for rule breaking. So again, a big value effect. Second, can we show that the procedures through which authority is exercised in these settings shapes value activation? Absolutely. This looks a lot like what you saw for for-profit employees, that if there's procedural justice in the workplace, so for example, in your infantry unit, if you're being treated fairly in the decision making, in the way that you're treated as a person, you view authorities, well, that's the armed forces, you view authorities as legitimate, you think that the policies of the army are consistent with your moral values, same basic argument for police and federal agents. In both cases, a key antecedent, procedural justice. And I'll just make one side comment that's not represented in this data, and that is in the case of both the Army and the police, there's one specific aspect of procedural justice that emerges as consistently the central question, and that is are you treated with decency and respect by your supervisor? 
So your unit commander, your police sergeant, if agents feel that they personally experience fair treatment in the sense of courtesy, respect, concern about their well-being, they are more likely to view the organization as legitimate, moral, and more likely to follow the rules. Okay, so to go back to the core question, what can psychology contribute to a discussion among legal scholars? I think what we can do is to try to convince you that there may be different approaches to traditional legal issues than are often the, the approaches that we step forward with first when we're having a discussion about how to manage some kind of wrongdoing. The argument here is that we want to change the, th the way we think about the kind of behavior we want and change the way we think about motivation. So first, instead of thinking about compliance, which is a constant problem because you can't be everywhere all the time. Let's think about deference. How can we get people to buy into and willingly adhere to rules? So that two years after you were convicted of drunk driving, you're still following the law in a situation where surveillance is going to be low. <coughs> Second, instead of thinking about sanctioning, let's think about values. How can we get people to engage their values so that they're wanting, <clears throat> or at least feeling obligated, to follow the rules? It's not just a risk judgment. Empirical conclusions, first, values do matter. You can motivate rule following by appealing to values, and second, we know how to create organizational settings so that people feel they're legitimate, feel that they're moral, and that has to do with the policies and practices that are used to make decisions, the way in which people experience themselves as being treated. Thank you. <laughs>